Dogman Ate My Birthday Dear Scary Stories NYC One year when I was a young man, I got nothing at all for my birthday, even though my family threw a big party for me. Of course, they tried to give me a big dinner and presents, but the problem was that Dogman Ate My Birthday. This was a very long time ago, back when we still had a draft. I was shipped overseas and my family had received rumors from some of my friends who shipped back home that I had bought it out there. I was actually unconscious and unidentified in a hospital for a while, but I did get back home alive and in one piece. So I got a big welcome back by the family who had already begun to accept that they might never see me again. A few of them told me it was like a miracle to see me. And it was a truly great homecoming when they all met me at the train station. We hugged and we laughed and we cried and all that stuff. But what was to happen next would serve as a harsh omen. Returning home to civilian life was not going to be one long celebration for me. It was in fact not going to be a very easy life for me from that point forward. I'm not complaining, but it would be lying to state otherwise. So, there were family members I had never seen before who came out to that train station and I was told there was a catered meal waiting for us out in our family's backyard. The occasion was also right around my birthday, so people had presents piled up back there as well, according to what they were telling me. When we left the train station, it was like a parade from there to our house. I forget if there were five or six cars all following my father's lead as we drove to the family home. But what we found when we got there was to put a damper on the day for everyone. My first clue that something was out of place was when I saw some of our neighbors standing in the middle of the street, pointing down our driveway and looking alarmed. Since the driveway was blocked by neighbors, people were parking in the middle of the street and getting out of their cars to figure out what was happening down our driveway. By the time we got there, the main action had already taken place, but the caterers and a few of our neighbors explained what happened, which was that the dog man happened. Or werewolf, I suppose. I mean, it looked like a werewolf. A canine-headed, furry humanoid. Tall. Muscle-bound. Hungry. This beast man tore out of the woods behind our block of houses. And he tore into the catering. Very little of the food was able to be saved, although the staff tried to bring it into the house. The dog man was just too fast for him. He was smart, too. He first spilled as much food as possible on the ground, and then he started eating. It was as though he knew that humans wouldn't want it anymore once it had fallen into the grass and dirt. Maybe the creature had been studying us for all I know. Studying humans, I mean, not necessarily my family. If the dogman had started eating one thing, the staff could have rescued much more. But he knocked it all down first, as if claiming it as his own before eating one single bite. And nobody thought to bring my presents inside as they were not edible and none of the people present thought the dogman would even go after them. Of course, they thought wrong, as the next thing he did after eating was tear apart the colorfully wrapped gifts one by one, as if looking for more food inside or something. Each present was utterly crushed, torn up, demolished, and shredded. Some of them were pounded to dust in places. One of my neighbors broke down in tears, telling me how she had saved up to buy me a very special guitar to welcome me back to life, only to watch the dog man smash it to bits, like he thought he was Jimi Hendrix or something. There was nothing left of any of the presents. The creature had even torn up greeting cards and checks that people had wanted to give me. Since most of the food was gone, people left and the core family had something to eat. While we were eating, the trees in the back rustled, and out of them walked a great beast, with eyes that glowed in the evening sunset. It looked like Anubis had gone on a drunken rampage or something, as though it were intelligent, yet savage. And it was carrying something nasty over its shoulder. We all stood up and back toward the house, keeping our eyes on that monster. It took whatever was over its shoulder and flung it forward onto the lawn, where it splattered a bit as it slammed down. The women screamed. When my eyes could focus on what that was, I saw that it was a deer. Well, part of a deer. Of the rear part. The wolfman looked at us each in turn in the eye. And then he turned and walked back into the woods he had come out of. 
leaving the half a deer carcass where it was on the lawn. Payment in full, said my father, and then I realized what had just happened. The dogman had come to give us the deer meat to pay for having eaten my birthday while he was in his food frenzy. So I guess I can't say I didn't get anything for my birthday that year. And that means it was a lot better than most birthdays since then. I don't think the dogman meant any harm. He just can't help being a living omen of doom. If you want a coloring book full of monstrously light, then give this a look. It'll give you more fright, fright. Scary stories, coloring book, werewolf coloring book. And just to make your mind explode, it's a digital download. All it costs is 209, and then you will be feeling fine. Coloring monsters today, hey, it's a coloring book parade. Okay, link is in the description. Grandma's Motorcycle Riding Werewolf Boyfriend Dear Scary Stories NYC My Grandma Pearl was a wild woman. She dated a motorcycle riding gang member before she dated my grandpa. And we've since learned that she continued to cut away and have a sneaky romance with that motorcycle guy for almost two decades while she was married to grandpa. Somehow, it seems that a number of Grandma's belongings ended up in the attic of my cousin Elwood, who recently passed, and we've been going through it, learning much about our family that none of us had ever known before. The reason we think you might be interested in all of this is that the motorcycle guy that Grandma dated apparently identified as a werewolf. I had seen a video you made earlier about a similar subject, so I thought this would be right up your alley. Now, what I mainly want to send you, and what I've spent nearly a month transcribing so far, is an unfinished, handwritten book, pieced together by hand, page by page, and apparently written in a Kerouacian stream of consciousness format. Grandma would write a chapter, then her werewolf lover would write the next, and so forth. The uh, chapters can be as short as 200 or 300 words, so it's almost like poetry or shared storytelling at points. I've tried to narrow it down a bit and taken out some of the more personal material. I mainly want to include the discussions of being a werewolf or dating a werewolf that I think might be more interesting to your audience than some of the other more personal content. Now, the whole book looks like it was taped together by hand, and as I said, it goes back and forth between the two of them. I'll head up her chapters or pages by saying her, and when it's about to be him writing, I'll tell you that. Ready? Let's go back in time to before any of us were born when my late grandmother was 17 or 18 years old and convinced she was in love with a bad boy motorcycle marauder. She dates the first entry May 6, 1947, but she rarely dates any succeeding entries. Okay, her. I remember the first day I saw him riding his motorcycle down the road. It was as if time had stopped. I couldn't take my eyes off of him. He had long, flowing black hair that whipped around in the wind like a native brave that you'd see in a western movie serial, and he had piercing green eyes. I didn't know what his race or background was. I didn't even really know that he was human. All that I did know was that I was mesmerized. It started with simple flirting, but soon enough, we were riding together on his bike to events around Wisconsin and then surrounding states as well. It was pure magic riding with him, the wind in our hair, and the sound of that formidable engine roaring beneath us. For almost six months, we were like that, simply enjoying each other's company on the road. I was always there at his side, but we were actually still just friends, and he was far more gentle than I had expected, far more than I think I wanted him to be, actually. It felt like he was holding back when we were alone. It always seemed like he had something to tell me that he hadn't yet. And then, one night, something changed. He took me to a secluded spot by the river, and under the moonlight, he transformed. I had never seen anything like that before. His body grew and contorted, until he was no longer a man, 
but a great furry beast. It was such a surreal sight. It almost felt like a dream. It started with his long black hair, growing thicker and bushier, covering his bare chest. I could see his already considerable muscles bulging even further as he shook his entire body, undergoing a violent metamorphosis. His face elongated into a canine snout. His teeth sharpened into fangs as his eyes glowed a bright green. But what surprised me the most was how I felt about the transformation. I was overjoyed, ecstatic even, witnessing the immense power and beauty of this creature before me. I knew deep down that it was still my loving boyfriend inside. As he grew in size, standing at an immense eight feet tall, I couldn't help but admire him. His fur was so soft and velvety, and the way his muscles rippled under it was a sight to behold. His claws were sharp and gleaming in the moonlight, and I couldn't resist reaching out to stroke his fur. He let out a powerful howl, and I felt my heart soar with happiness. I knew that this was the man I loved, no matter what form he assumed. We spent the rest of the night by the river, enjoying each other's company, as he ran around in his werewolf form. I had heard stories of werewolves before, of course, but to see one in the flesh was both terrifying and exhilarating. My heart raced, but at the same time, I was fascinated. As he stood before me in his new form, I couldn't decide which I found more appealing, his human form with its rugged good looks and chiseled jawline, or his werewolf form with its raw power and sheer physical presence. We eventually became an item, but I had already fallen in love with him. He was my perfect match in whatever shape he took. I loved being with him on his bike, loved feeling the wind whip around us as we took to the road, but equally I loved simply sitting at home with him, in his human form, just talking and laughing together. He's the most incredible person I've ever known. I feel fortunate to know him, and maybe even more fortunate to be loved by him. Him. As I felt the power of the full moon coursing through my veins, my body began to change. My bones cracked and stretched, lengthening and reshaping into something new. My skin sprouted a thick coat of fur as claws burst forth from my fingertips and sharp teeth filled my mouth. It was a violent transformation, a painful one. But at the same time, it felt like coming home. I felt my senses sharpening, my vision clearing. Sounds that had been muted in my human form were suddenly vivid and clear, the sense of the world filling my nostrils. I felt my muscles bulging, my breath coming in short, fierce pants as I stood there, breathing in the night air. I now was the night, a fierce predator, a wolf man. As the night wore on, I prowled through the woods, hunting and howling at the moon. The power of my new body was overwhelming, and I reveled in it, embracing the savage nature that had been unleashed within me. But as dawn began to approach, I knew it was time to return to my human form. And so, with a deep breath, I began to force my body to change again. The fur receded, my claws and teeth shrinking back into my body. My bones shifted and realigned, the transformation back to human form just as painful and intense as the first. Finally, I stood there, shivering, my heart pounding in my chest. But at the same time, I felt a sense of satisfaction, of fulfillment, of being complete. And as I turned toward her, I could see the same pleasure in her eyes that I felt. Wow, she breathed, running her hands over my chest and down my arms. That was incredible. I can't believe I got to watch you transform like that. I smiled, feeling a wave of contentment wash over me. It's a part of who I am, and thanks to you, I told her, I could finally embrace it. We stood there, basking in the afterglow of my transformation, 
both of us still in awe of the power that had been unleashed. And as we headed back towards civilization, we knew that this was just the beginning of our journey together. Her. I was raised to be a God-fearing woman, attending church every Sunday and following every teaching. But ever since I met my motorcycle-riding werewolf boyfriend, I find myself behaving in whatever way might please him. It's not like I've abandoned my faith entirely, but I haven't been to church since we started dating. I've waited outside while he committed crimes inside, something I never thought I would do. It's like I'm a completely different person when I'm with him. I've abandoned my upbringing to make myself a more suitable werewolf mate, and sometimes I question my own behavior. But when I'm with him, I feel alive like I never have before. That animal side of him is something I crave, even though it's completely opposite to everything I was raised to believe in. It's like I can't resist him. We talked about getting married, and I can't help but think about how different my life will be from what I thought it would be like. I never imagined myself being with a werewolf, let alone waiting outside while he broke the law. I know I need to find a way to reconcile my upbringing with my current life, but I just don't know how. Part of me feels guilty, but another part of me just wants to embrace this new life and forget everything that I was taught. It's a difficult internal struggle, one that I can't seem to shake off. I don't know where my life is headed, but I do know that I'm in love with a werewolf. And that fact alone changes everything I thought I knew about myself and my future. Him. I am a werewolf gang member, born and raised on the open road on the back of a motorcycle. My brothers in my club are the only family I've ever needed, but that all changed when I met her. She was a good girl, innocent and pure, with a beauty that took my breath away. We were from two different worlds. But something about her drew me in and I couldn't resist. We fell in love. And now, she's the only thing that matters to me. She wanted to get married before God in a church. But I knew that could never be the case for me. I was a werewolf. A creature of the night. And marrying in a church would be blasphemy. But that didn't mean I didn't want to marry her. No, I do. I want to make her like me. I want to turn her into a werewolf and make her my mate for life. I want to marry her in the eyes of nature, not God. And I want to roam the country together on our motorcycles, causing havoc wherever we go. But I knew from the start that wouldn't be an easy task. Turning someone into a werewolf is dangerous, and there's no guarantee that she'll even survive the process. But I am willing to take that risk. I love her too much to let her go. So now I ride with my gang, planning and scheming. I want us to be together forever, running free under the moonlit sky, our motorcycles roaring in unison. I know some may see me as a monster, but to her, I am her everything, and I will do everything in my power to make her mine, even if it means changing her forever. Her. Well, it seems that werewolves have a different idea of what marriage means than we humans do. I can't believe it's come to this. I, a Christian woman, am seriously considering leaving my faith and my way of life for the man I love. But he's not just any man. He's a werewolf. A real one. And he wants me to be one, too. God help me. I'm considering letting him have his way. At first it all seemed like fun and games. I enjoyed learning about his pagan beliefs and rituals, and I was fascinated by the idea of transforming into a wolf every full moon. It excited me to watch my man become something else right in front of my eyes. But as our relationship grew more serious, I began asking him about marriage, and he began pressuring me in turn to fully embrace his way of life. I know in my heart that what he's asking me to do is wrong, I was raised to believe in the goodness and mercy of the Lord, and I can't bear the thought of turning my back on God. But at the same time, I can't bear the thought of losing the man I love, either. 
And I pray to God every night for guidance, but the answer has yet to come to me. I feel torn between my heart and my faith, and it's tearing me apart. I don't want to disappoint my family, my church, or my God, but I can't bear the thought of losing that man. I wish there was someone I could talk to, someone who would understand my struggles and offer me guidance. But in this small town, there sure aren't many people who would understand my situation. I guess it's up to me to make the decision. I know what I should do. I should leave this man and return to my Christian faith. But my heart aches at the thought of never seeing him again. And yet, I can't just abandon everything I've ever believed in, can I? God, give me guidance. Show me the way to go. Help me make the right decision. I know that with you by my side I can face anything, even the temptation to turn my back on you. Please give me the strength to make the right choice, no matter how hard it might be. Him. My friends are pressuring me to let my Christian girlfriend go, to let her go marry a man like her and live her normal life during the daylight hours. But then, when I happen to crave her from moon to moon, I will still be able to charm her and avail myself of her attention in return. She's normal. Let her be normal, they tell me. It's good to have alliances in the daylight world of regular people. You never know when such an alliance might save your life. I know that what they say makes sense, but to me, this is a love affair for the ages, not a calculated move to get some satisfaction. When I say things like that to my werewolf friends, though, they look at me as though I had six heads or something. I think they're wondering if I'm speaking gibberish or pig Latin. I'm heading for a meeting with my love right now. We have given ourselves until tonight to make our decision. Her. I made my decision while praying in church. I will tell my wolf that he can stay my friend and that he can keep in touch with me, but that I need to be free and to find a normal man and return to my Christian life. I wasn't meant to be a werewolf, and to take me away from my family would kill my mother and my aunts and my sister. I rehearsed the speech in my head for hours, and I got myself into a really serious mood about it. I assumed he would try to talk me out of it, so I was braced, and ready to stop him from changing my mind. Even if he cried, I would still stand firm, because we needed to break up. But then we met near the river in the woods at our spot, and before I could say anything, he told me that it was time for me to go back to my normal Christian life. He gave me the speech that I had planned on giving him, but when he said it, everything sounded so sad and so final. I broke down in tears and I begged him not to dump me. I promised I'd be a good girlfriend, that he was more important to me than my family or even my God. That beautiful green-eyed monster man looked at me sympathetically, but told me that I could never stop being a Christian. I was going to marry a Christian man. I was going to have Christian children and grandchildren. And then, when he had me fully weeping and begging him, he told me that, hey, I could always cheat on my husband. I was shocked even though the husband we were discussing was entirely hypothetical. I hadn't even met a man that I wanted to marry, and I was already planning to cheat on him. It seemed so wrong. It was something that might get me sent to hell for all eternity. But I readily agreed to be the mistress of this smooth-talking, wolf-headed godling. I would be his loving servant as well. I would worship him on every occasion he gave me the opportunity and yet I would raise a family and seem to be a normal person on the outside. I had no choice but to not only agree, but to thank him for keeping me on as a backup girlfriend. It went against everything I've ever held dear, and yet I willingly do this so that I don't lose this man from my life. There is the final entry dated some years after the first. Him. I ran into my mistress's husband in the woods this morning, and we had a most interesting conversation. He says that he has acquired all of my correspondence with his missus, and he's compiled the letters into a book of sorts. 
He's also taken presents given to his wife by other men that she had dalliances with and put the entirety of it up in the attic of a relative. I asked whether she had given him permission to do such a thing and he began to engage in fisticuffs, which, as painful as it was, at least got me to laugh. It seems the fellow wants me to write one final letter to his wife telling her that I will no longer be sniffing around her bedroom when he's out of town. I asked the fellow why I would ever agree to such a thing, and he began to threaten my life. Again, this induced laughter in me, but he began to list names. At first, I didn't really understand the meaning of those names that he was listing. I mean, I knew who these men were that he was naming, but I failed to recognize the context. Finally, the listing stopped, and he told me that all of those men had been alerted to the fact that I'm a werewolf. Now, this is most inconvenient, as my family does business with all of those gentlemen. Apparently, my options are to leave town or to find myself in town permanently, but six feet under the ground of said town. As I am clearly outnumbered, I have no choice but to do what this gentleman asks. My dear, I am afraid we cannot carry on our infatuation at least for a while. See to it that the human leaves you a large inheritance, then send out the signal to me to return. Do you doubt that I will outlive your pasty-faced husband? Weep not, my darling, for we will meet again. And that's it. That's the last page pasted into the book. Of course, now we know it was Grandpa who made the book, not Grandma, so we really don't know if she and the wolf got back together later on in life or not. I do know that Grandpa passed away in 1979, so it's not impossible. But since Grandma herself is gone, and all her belongings were gone through years ago, it doesn't seem as though there's any more evidence yet to come out about whether or not this romance really ended with the last page in that handmade book, or whether it continued on past the end of our grandfather's life. I'm not sure how I feel about it either way. I mean, I don't think the werewolf was the father of any grandma's children, so he doesn't really matter inside our family history, except in the sense that he was the guy who almost kept all of us from being born in the first place. I can't help but find myself full of questions for... <laughs> Grandma's Motorcycle Riding Werewolf Boyfriend Yvonne Marshall on the lizard. Yvonne Marshall, she's a wizard. Please join me in thanking today's executive producer, Yvonne Marshall on the lizard in Cornwall. Her monthly donations make this show possible, and we literally couldn't do it without people like her. Thank you so much, Yvonne. Sunday go to meeting Dogman Stories. Welcome to Scary Stories. Over the years, I've gotten a number of submissions that I wasn't sure what to do with. There wasn't any location info sometimes. Other times, the witness disappeared after sending me one email. In this case, I'm referring to a bunch of stories about werewolves and dogmen being encountered in and around spooky old churches in the woods. People tend not to want to out their family's church, and so each of the stories would get vague in spots. There was never enough info for me to locate where any of this was supposed to have happened. Still, I got two more submissions like this recently, and it caused me to go searching through my archives and track down the other similar stories. I've compiled them together to form this episode, and I saved the most gruesome one for our channel members and PayPal club members, and a special members-only story which should hopefully be out right now, if not it comes out later tonight. After recently reading and adapting parts of Tulin the Godfrey Real Werewolves books, these submissions seemed to take on an extra meaning for me. Why? Because as Godfrey and others have pointed out, many churches are built on spots that were already considered holy or magic or powerful in some way, even before the church was built. In many cases, churches are built over spots that had been considered important since before Christianity even existed. We already know that dogman and werewolf sightings, whatever it is that people are seeing, tend to be more likely to happen in areas such as old native mound sites and cemeteries. There are a number of theories as to why this might be, including that these mounds 
might have been built to mark a portal area or a window area. Maybe some churches and graveyards in rural areas in the U.S. were built on spots where strange things were known to occur already. It would seem to be the case if there is in fact any truth at all to any of these stories that I'm about to share with you. Of course, I don't really know if there is. So keep that in mind and don't view any of the following as hard evidence. In court, this would all be referred to as hearsay, but it's pretty interesting hearsay, so I'm going to say it for you to hear. Make up your own minds about how you feel about each one of these. Story number one. A church in Maine and a werewolf who followed me home. Dear Scary Stories NYC, I grew up in a town in Maine, son of a son of a military man. I myself went into the army and served a single tour of duty overseas. Things didn't go well for me over there, and I got known as having bad luck. I began to stop expecting to ever make it back home again. In fact, I was convinced I would never return stateside ever again. So when I did return to Maine, and my family came to greet me, I kind of freaked out. I wasn't sure if it was real. It felt like a dream, but it didn't feel good. Like maybe I was being lied to, or maybe lying to myself. I had stopped believing that anything good could happen to me. I kept unintentionally hurting people's feelings. They would hug me, but I couldn't remember how to hug back. Not sincerely, anyway. I knew that I was a ghost, not a man. I knew I wasn't supposed to be back in the States. Maybe it was guilt from watching my friends and how they all left this world. I did have one ex-girlfriend who was actually very understanding about what I was going through. But my parents and my brother were very angry at me. They told me over and over how disappointed they were with me. And I took to walking in the woods more and more. I couldn't believe I was really back in those woods any more than I could really believe I was back with my family. But the forest didn't take it so very personally that I was having such a hard time adjusting. One time I wandered over to this church that some of my family still walk to up on a hill in the woods. I'm not going to tell you where, so please don't ask. It's a place where my family is buried and I might eventually be as well, and it's too private to share. I found it emotionally overwhelming walking up to that church. Still, I was in this paranoid Truman's World state of mind, and I inspected the tombstones to see if this was the real place, or if I was captured by the enemy, and they were making me walk through a virtual reality simulation. It turned out that I remembered some of the tombstone family names and inscriptions, but not all of them. This felt inconclusive to me, since maybe it was the program they had me inside of, which was remembering the tombstone names wrong. Who could tell? So as I was wandering between the graves, trying to remember what reality itself was, I accidentally disturbed this hairy weirdo who seemed to be digging up a freshly buried grave. My first instinct was to stop him from what he was doing, but my overwhelming sadness overruled that. I was too busy feeling sorry and confused to want to play do-gooder on that evening. It didn't matter, though. The hairy weirdo saw me seeing him. He literally screamed in the air in his way that reminded me of how my childhood dog would howl when he was alarmed. I say howl, but I don't necessarily mean that he was calling other canines to him. It was almost sort of a dog scream. It would happen when something made a loud noise nearby and that sort of thing, when he got startled. So I figured I must have startled this weirdo. And I put my hands up, palms toward him, started saying, I had no beef with you guy. I tried to sort of start walking away from him sideways while still keeping my eyes on him. But then I saw that he did not care about what I had to say at all. This was a big guy on two legs to be sure and he was running toward me with an angry look on his face. That was true as well. The thing is, he did not have a human head up on his broad muscular shoulders. 
He had a big round head, like a mix between a black bear and a black furred Akita dog. This was no weirdo hippie. This was a man-sized monster, and it was growling at me and running toward me on two strong muscular legs. I turned and ran. I never felt this kind of fear overseas. It was like I forgot all my training. When I ran from that big dogman, I was a little kid running from the boogeyman. I did not react well in the face of danger. But I tell you what, in that moment I stopped caring if this was real or a game. I only knew that I wanted to survive. And as scared and pathetic as I was acting, at least I was dragged back into the land of the living by the shock of this. I had no choice but to be present in the moment, and every bit of me was focused on getting back home. Well, the parts of me that weren't whimpering like a baby at least. I think the creature pulled back a bit when I got within range of the back door of my family's home, because I got inside easily and I locked up behind me. That's not to say that the creature hid itself from my family because it did not. My father and older brother both got the artillery out when the thing stood in our backyard, yelling werewolf curse words at me from the sound of it. It seemed to know what those boomsticks were that they were holding, because it retreated before either one of them could line up a shot. That doesn't mean it went away, though. Somehow this situation brought our family together, and all the bickering was put aside. As night fell into darkness, it also became unnaturally quiet outside. I couldn't even hear all the crickets out there as usual. What kind of animal even scares little insects that are hiding away in the first place? Well, this werewolf-looking thing. That's what kind of animal. Once in a while through the night, our house would get hit by some small rock or acorn or something. We never saw them, but we could hear them. In fact, so far none of us have ever seen the dogman or wolfman again. But he will wake us up in the night by throwing things at our house, or even throwing things at the windows of our rooms while we sleep. He just doesn't like our family, and we take a number of extra security measures ever since. Maybe that's why we've never seen him again so far. One of my older brother's friends from his army days is a ghost hunter now. He came over for dinner one night and he heard something hitting the house at the wall behind them. We all got up and looked out the window. When we couldn't see anything out of the ordinary out there, we all said it was the werewolf hiding in the woods throwing pebbles at us. My brother's ghost hunter friend though, he said he thought it was an apportation. You see, in some hauntings, he said, things can get teleported or apported. Like a penny can drop out of the ceiling of a room and it's usually hot to the touch if you grab it soon enough. So this guy told us that if we were ever able to see one of those things that we hear being thrown at us, we should try to touch the object as soon as possible. If it's very hot to the touch, then maybe it was not thrown. Maybe it was a teleportation or apportation. Now, I don't understand any of that, but I thought I should include what he said and let you listeners decide if it's relevant information or not. I'm kind of hoping that writing this up for you means it's finally over. If any of us have any future problems with this thing, though, don't be too surprised if you find a part two in your email. Story number two. The snow was drifting upward when I saw the werewolf creature. Dear Scary Stories NYC, I saw a dogman or werewolf one time and it felt like something more was happening than just the sighting of a rare animal. In fact, the entire area seemed to be experiencing some sort of strange atmospheric disturbance of some kind. This happened on a day in December that was not warm, but it should have been too warm for us to experience snowfall. Nevertheless, when that werewolf thing was in our view, we watched it snow in almost 50 degree weather, and we saw the snow fall for a while, then rise back upward as if an updraft of wind were coming out of the earth itself. Let me explain this all in context. My friend had dared me to walk through the cemetery behind the old church in our woods one night. I kept telling him to pound sand until he bet me $50 that I was too chicken to do it. Not for $50 I wasn't. 
This church looks kind of haunted and abandoned, especially in the dark, but it isn't. They still have Sunday church services there. In fact, it's two different congregations that both take turns. But I guess neither congregation can afford to give the place a new coat of paint or whatever. So it really does look spooky sitting out there in the woods with a graveyard behind it and all of that. So me, my friend who had dared me and both our girlfriends made our way out into the woods in the middle of the night so I could win that $50 and then take us all out for a little bit of partying. When we got to the place, both girls complained that it was colder there than anywhere else. The other three of them did seem pretty scared, and they asked me to call it off. I said, no way, $50 is $50. So I walked into that cemetery in the dark behind the creepy old church, and I saw snow in the air all around me. I never really noticed it falling but I saw it being held aloft and floating back upward by updrafts of air that I couldn't feel myself. I did feel around in the air, but it all felt static and cold to me. How was the snow floating upward? I felt very confused about everything that was happening. And then, I noticed that dogman, that werewolf, whatever it was. The two of us locked eyes, and at this point my memory of what happened is different from my three friends. In my memory, the dogman told me a story in my mind. He made me feel like I was both watching a movie and hearing a history at the same time. I heard the epic tale of a race of people from the stars who came to this planet and helped to create the human race. He called me grandson. No, he, he, he called all of us his grandsons. All people, all humans. The other three say that the creature ran off as soon as we saw it. When I stood there in place frozen, they all came into the cemetery and they tried to snap me out of it. Now, I don't remember any of that. I remember receiving the communication about the history, and I was told to tell my friends that we will soon have to make a place at the table for Grandfather. They agree about that part. They say I was babbling about how this is Grandfather's place, and soon Grandfather will take it back from us. In my head, I feel as though I should be terrified of what was told to me by that creature. It doesn't matter, though. I feel incredibly blessed to have been chosen by him to deliver his message. I hope that if he ever needs assistance from another human, that he remembers to call on me. Story number three. We live near an evil church. Dear Scary Stories NYC, The older kids in my town told me that our church was really secretly run by a bunch of bad people. Let's just say they don't actually worship who and what they say they worship. And if you let them bury you in that cemetery behind our church, well, the older kids say that your remains will get eaten up by a real werewolf that comes out at night over there. I was pretty sure this was all stuff they made up to scare us because we're younger than they are. But then me and my girlfriend saw a real werewolf out in front of that church the other night. And I'm starting to wonder how much of the rest of this might also be true. Maybe it's all true. What happened was that we got this dumb idea in our head that we could cut through those woods where the old church and graveyard are located and get back to my house from her house quicker. Honestly, we were hoping we could also use it as a place to go hang out in private, away from the eyes of the world. We could have just looked at Google Maps to see that it was a longer route home than the normal way. I don't think that would have stopped us from checking it out though. If you've ever been in love, then you remember that feeling like the world is magical. And everything is meant to be, right? We were blissed out, and the forest seemed enchanted to us, like we were in a Disney movie from a hundred years ago or something. But yeah, as we got closer to the church, my girlfriend motioned for me to shut up, so I did. When I looked where she was looking, I saw a werewolf standing right there, 
or a dogman or whatever you'd want to say. I mean, it didn't have its species around its wrist written in Latin or whatever. And I don't really know if it was a man dog or a lady dog, since it wasn't clearly presenting in either way, as far as my extremely limited knowledge of werewolf gender would go. But the facts of the matter that nobody can dispute would be that it was taller than I am, and I'm 5 foot 11. It was entirely covered in darker black dog fur, it had a big round dog head, and a relatively short dog snout. It had dog ears that stood up on top, and most importantly of all, it was staring directly back at me and my girlfriend. My girlfriend told me quietly, told still, and to look at her instead of the monster. Well, I held still, but I couldn't take my eyes off of that thing. It began to growl and took a step toward us. I was hyperventilating. My girlfriend sounded angry and told me to look at her and not the monster. I saw the werewolf dogman getting angrier and angrier, and I couldn't look away. And then I heard my girlfriend opening her jacket and pulling her top up. I tore my eyes away from the dogman, and sure enough, she had pulled her top up right there in those cold, dark woods behind the church graveyard. And before I could even drink them in, I saw those remarkable assets in her portfolio get covered over again, and I saw my girlfriend running toward my home. This woke me up and I followed her. Fortunately, the dogman didn't, as far as we know anyway. Follow us home, I mean. So we still don't know if it's true that the church between our homes is really secretly run by demon worshippers. But we do know that it's true that some kind of upright werewolf dogman animal does stalk that churchyard at night. I'm recording shows and everything's swelly because Godzilla Tim bought food for my belly. Please join me in thanking today's executive producer Godzilla Tim in Ireland. He sent us a big donation for food and it got spent in its entirety at Trader Joe's because that's the most affordable food store in the city right now. Basically, when you donate to us, you're donating money to Trader Joe's and food to me because that's the state of things in 2023 as everybody knows. Godzilla Tim knows this. And he's the main reason I even got this show done today. He's also partially responsible for the secret members-only episodes that he gets to see. You can see them too, including the all-new Werewolf Creature in the Church Basement, which was going to be part 4 of this very episode until I realized how bloody it is. Better to save that for a secret, uncensored episode only viewable by cool people like the great Godzilla Tim. <laughs> We saw the Laughing Dogman of High Cliff State Park. Dear Scary Stories NYC, I have always been fascinated by the paranormal, the unexplainable, and things that go bump in the night. So when my girlfriend and I decided to go camping at High Cliff State Park in Sherwood, Wisconsin, I was hoping to finally witness some of the spirits or ghosts that supposedly haunt that area. I had always heard about High Cliff State Park in Sherwood, Wisconsin since I was a kid. My friends and family had always told me the scary rumors and ghost stories about the place. They talked about how it was haunted by spirits and how people had disappeared there without a trace. As intrigued as I was, I had also been scared to visit the park. One of my friends told me about a legend that said a woman in a white dress would appear in the middle of the night just to vanish without a trace. Another friend said that he had seen figures walking in the woods when he went there for a hike with his family. It was always the same story. People seeing things that could not be explained. Strange noises, whispers, and feelings of being watched or followed. I was a bit skeptical about the stories, but I couldn't deny the fact that there seemed to be an agreement among those I knew who had visited the place that this area was truly unsettling in some hard-to-define way. My girlfriend and I found a bunch of different theories and stories that people had written about online. Some claimed that the park was cursed, 
and that the spirits of Native Americans who had been buried there were haunting the area. Others said that the park was built on ancient burial grounds and that terrible things tended to happen to people who dared to disturb the land. I even found one story that talked about a cult that had sacrificed animals in the area and that still left evidence of their rituals on trees surrounding the park. It was all pretty unsettling, but I had to admit that there was something intriguing about the idea of exploring such an eerie place. We decided that we had to check it out for ourselves, even if we were scared. The day my girlfriend and I finally went to High Cliff State Park was an epic one. Although we were both excited to explore, there was a palpable sense of unease in the air. She and I hiked through the woods, taking care not to stray too far from the trail. Every time we heard a twig snap or a rustle in the bushes, we froze, waiting to see what would appear. But like a jump scare early in a horror picture, there was nothing each time. At least, at first. At one point, clouds gathered, and we started hearing thunder in the distance. The skies darkened almost to the point of night as clouds covered the sky and the wind picked up. We stopped to rest and decide what to do next, and that's when I saw something that made my blood run cold. In the distance, I saw a woman in a white dress. She was standing perfectly still. She was looking straight at me. But when I turned to my girlfriend to get her to look, I couldn't see the lady any longer when I looked back. I didn't know if it was just my imagination or if I had actually seen something, but I tell you it was enough to make me respect the high strangeness of High Cliff State Park. In fact, that was when the two of us just started calling it High Strangeness State Park for short. We decided to try to hike a while in the oncoming rain because I didn't think I could sleep there where I'd seen the lady in white. But the longer we hiked, the sunnier it got. So we just kept hiking. We were looking for a clearing to camp in far away from the scary place where I'd seen the first ghost of my life. As we hiked through the dense woods, I noticed that the forest was thick with towering trees, their branches supporting a canopy of leaves that filtered the sunlight. I could see tall oaks in every direction, mixing with tall maples and ash trees. The forest floor was carpeted with ferns and wildflowers, each vying for space in the narrow gaps between the trees. As I made my way deeper into the forest, I caught sight of a deer grazing among the undergrowth. The buck sniffed the air, then pranced gracefully out of sight, his white tail flapping in the breeze. As evening approached, the forest came alive with the sounds of birds and crickets. I heard the high-pitched calls of woodpeckers drilling for insects, and the haunting melodies of songbirds, like the robin and the cardinal. The sun was beginning to set, and I was starting to worry about finding a suitable place to set up camp before it got dark. My girlfriend seemed unfazed by our predicament, but I knew we needed to find a clearing before we were caught out in the wilderness in the dark. We had been hiking for hours, and I was beginning to tire. We had hoped to find a decent campsite much earlier in the day, but we had been unable to find anywhere that looked safe. We had been walking through dense foliage and rocky terrain, and I was starting to worry that we might have to spend the night in the open wilderness. But then, as we rounded a particular rocky bend in the trail, I saw it. A clearing. It was small, but it was the perfect size for our tent. And it was sheltered by trees on all sides. It would be a perfect place to camp for the night. Excitedly, I pointed out the clearing to my girlfriend. But to my surprise, she looked uneasy. She looked at me with a worried expression, but she couldn't explain why she was feeling scared. I tried to reassure her, pointing out all the reasons that this was a great place to set up camp. The trees would shelter us from the wind, and the clearing was well hidden, so we shouldn't be visible to any passers-by. I reminded her of the bear-proof food canister I had brought along, which would keep our food safe from hungry bears. But my girlfriend still hesitated. I could see she was uncertain but she wasn't sure why. I tried to be patient and understanding, but I was getting frustrated. I couldn't understand why she was so reluctant to camp in such a great spot with night coming on. 
Finally, I convinced her to set up camp with me in the clearing. I couldn't help but feel a sense of excitement and anticipation as we set up our campsite, eager for what was to come. As I gathered dry wood for my campfire, I noticed the strong scent of pine and cedar trees mixed with the earthy aroma of the forest floor. The sweet scent of honeysuckle flowers filled the air, attracting bees and butterflies to their nectar. As the sun began to set, we started a fire and prepared our dinner of grilled burgers and corn on the cob. As I sat by my campfire, listening to the chorus of insects and birds, I felt a deep sense of peace and connection to nature. The beauty of the forest was like nothing else, and I was grateful for the opportunity to experience it firsthand. The warmth of the fire and the sounds of the woods around us were peaceful, but I couldn't shake the feeling of nervous anticipation. After dinner, I took a walk around our campsite, hoping to see or feel something out of the ordinary. As I wandered further into the woods, I suddenly caught a glimpse of two small amber lights in the distance. Thinking they might be the spirits I was searching for, I walked closer, heart pounding in my chest. But as I got closer, I realized that the lights were not coming from any supernatural source. They were the eye shine of a large animal. I pointed this out to my girlfriend who shrugged it off, saying it was just something nocturnal. I began to think she didn't believe me about my previous ghost sighting, and I wondered why she'd even come with me if she wasn't going to get into the spirit of things, as it were. I tried to ignore the lights, as my girlfriend had suggested, but the more I tried to ignore them, the more they seemed to be growing brighter and closer. It was as if they were beckoning me to come to it, to investigate them. Without much thought, I grabbed a flashlight and made my way toward the lights, with my girlfriend trying to convince me to turn back. As I moved into the forest, leaves and twigs crunched underfoot, and a strange pungent odor of sweat mixed with sulfur was suddenly detectable in the air. But I was too focused on the light to pay very much attention to anything else. I pushed forward, ignoring the voice inside my head screaming, Turn back. Turn back. Turn back. It's a bad idea. The lights appeared to be coming closer till I found myself standing face to face with a six and a half foot tall upright creature that had glowing yellow eyes looking back down at me. I couldn't believe what my eyes were seeing. It was a Wisconsin werewolf. I had read about them growing up, but never in my wildest dreams did I ever imagine I would be standing in front of one. The creature was huge, muscular, and it had long, sharp claws. Its fur was black as midnight, and its snout was long and pointed. Its glowing yellow eyes bore into me as if I was its next meal. I was stunned, standing still in shock and observing every detail about the creature before me. I could feel the heat of its breath on my face, and I could smell the stench of its sweat filling the air. The light that had been drawing me closer had been coming directly from its eyes. Suddenly, I heard a low growl, and I knew I had made a mistake. Panic set in as I turned to run back to our campsite. But the animal had to be faster than me, I knew. If I ran, he'd see me as prey, and he'd chase. As I realized what was about to happen, my legs suddenly kicked into motion, and I began to run as fast as I could back to our tent. The creature was chasing me with blinding speed, snarling and snapping its jaws behind me. I ran because my life depended on it, my heart pounding so hard, it felt like it was trying to escape from my chest. I could hear the creature's heavy footsteps keeping pace, forcing me to tire myself out, its breath hot and fierce on my back as I sprinted through the woods. It was close enough that I could feel its body heat behind me, and I knew that if I fell, that would be the end of me. My heart was pounding as I sprinted through the dense woods of High Cliff State Park, my feet pounding against the rough terrain. 
I could hear the snapping of twigs and rustling of leaves behind me. The sounds of the creature that was chasing me, echoing through the deep silence of the night. I felt my lungs burning with each breath, and my body crying out for rest. But I knew that I couldn't stop, not if I wanted to survive. I couldn't see my pursuer, but I knew it was there. Whatever that dogman was, it was relentless in its pursuit. I had caught a glimpse of it earlier, and I knew it was something unnatural, something that shouldn't exist. It was tall, well over six feet, with rippling muscles and fur covering its entire body. It was like a werewolf or a dogman come to life. I had heard the local legends of such creatures, but I had never truly believed them until then. The creature seemed to be playing with me, chasing me at just the right pace to keep me running at my top speed, but to never quite catch up to me. Its unnatural canine laughter echoed around me, taunting me, mocking me. I felt like a mouse being toyed with by a cat. The fear was overwhelming. Cold sweat poured down my face, and I tried my best to control my breathing, but it was hopeless. My mind raced with thoughts of what would happen if that monster caught me. Would it kill me? Eat me? Was there a way to fight back? But I knew deep down that whatever that creature was, it was going to be far stronger than I was. I stumbled over a tree root, and my ankle twisted painfully, but I didn't stop running. I kept going despite the pain, knowing that I had no other choice. The creature was getting closer, and I could hear its heavy panting. It was enjoying the chase, reveling in my terror. Suddenly I spotted a clearing ahead, the full moon casting a pale light through the trees. I knew I had to make it there. I poured all of my remaining energy into a final burst of speed, and I broke through the trees into the open space. The creature paused briefly at the edge of the clearing, still laughing, still mocking me, as if it knew I had reached the end of my journey. But then, as if sated, it turned and loped back into the forest, disappearing into the shadows. Well, I burst through those trees and back to our campsite. My girlfriend looked up startled as I collapsed onto the ground in front of her, gasping for breath, my heart still racing. I knew without a doubt that I had just come face to face with something beyond human understanding and that I had been lucky to escape with my life. I tried to explain what had just happened, but I found the words catching in my throat. My heart was still pounding in my chest, and my brain was struggling to comprehend what had just occurred. I heard the beast laugh its cackle somewhere in the woods, and this time I could see that my girlfriend heard it too. She told me it sounded like a hyena, but hyenas don't live in the United States. I asked her if hyenas were six feet tall and bipedal, and she threw sand on the fire, pulled me into the tent, and zipped it shut. Well, we spent the rest of that night huddled together, too scared to sleep. Every time we heard a twig snap or a branch rustle, we held our breath, wondering if the dogman had returned. As the sun rose over the horizon, casting a golden glow over the park, I couldn't help but feel grateful to be alive. But I also knew that my fascination with the paranormal had almost cost me dearly and that I needed to be more careful in the future. That night, my girlfriend told me her family's own dogman story. And believe me, that was a scary place to first hear it. I asked her to finish off this narrative for you with her telling of that story. So the rest of this is going to be in her words. Thanks for listening to me. And here she is in her own words. I remember my great uncle Harold vividly, despite only having met him a couple of times in my childhood. He was always talked about among my family, known for his eccentricities and his wild tales of adventure. One story that always stands out in my mind is the one about the upright walking hyena man 
He claimed to have been stalked by for weeks in the woods of Wisconsin. Growing up, I was fascinated and terrified by his account. He would describe this creature as having eyes that glowed a bright gold in the night. A haunting laugh that echoed through the forest both day and night. And a coat of fur that resembled that of a hyena. My uncle was convinced that it was not a figment of his imagination. That it was a real being out there in the Wisconsin woods. And that it was watching him every step of the way of his hike. I always wondered if these tales were true. Or just tall tales he had spun over the years. But hearing him speak with such conviction... It was hard not to believe. He would always tell us that he could feel the creature's gaze on him, even when he couldn't see it. That thought always sent shivers down my spine. As I grew older, I learned more about my great uncle through my family. He spent his later years as a recluse, living off the land in a cabin deep in the woods of northern Wisconsin. He rarely left his home and spent most of his days writing and reflecting on his life experiences. I couldn't help but wonder if his encounter with the hyena man had something to do with his reclusive lifestyle. Sadly, as years passed, my great-uncle's health deteriorated, and he passed away before I could have the chance to sit down with him and ask him more about his hyena man encounter. It's a story I think about often, wondering if it was real or just the product of a wild and imaginative mind. But for years when I thought of my great uncle, I couldn't help but think of his haunting tales and wonder if that upright hyena still roamed the woods of Wisconsin, laughing away. Now that my boyfriend and I have encountered the thing itself, I can have no doubt. I don't know if it's a hyena or a wolf or what it is, but I know it's real and I know it's out there because... We saw the laughing dogman of High Cliff State Park. I want to say a very special thank you today to our executive producer, Kathy Barrickman, who's more than just an executive producer to us, obviously. This is a very special thank you to a very special person. Thank you, Kathy Barrickman. Thank you for helping us stay going all these years. If you would like to help us stay on the air in this especially difficult and strange time, then check out what this next little guy has to say. Hank? Thanks, Biggie, and thanks to all of you for watching this far. If you liked it, please click like. If you'd like to see more of our work, please subscribe. And also click that bell icon if you'd like to be notified when we put out a new episode. To become an executive producer, you can donate to us through the thanks button under each of our videos or through our paypal.me slash peterbernard209 page. To receive cool perks like secret uncensored Dogman episodes far too wild to ever run on this channel, you can become a YouTube channel member by clicking the join button or join our PayPal subscribers club at peterbernard.com. Joining either at the $3 a month level or above gets you access to our over 25 hours of secret uncensored Dogman stories available nowhere else. Do you have a scary story about Dogman or some other kind of high strangeness that happened to you? Let us know by emailing us at scarystoriesnyc at gmail.com or by leaving us a voicemail message at 804 Lascary. You may need to call back on that when it cuts off after, I think, three minutes. And if you don't want to do any of that stuff, thank you for simply watching to the end. Good night, and have a scary tomorrow. Come back, come back for more scary, scary stories. stories.